Hi, everyone. Welcome to ADA Airwaves. My name is Larissa, and I'm the president of Alliance for Disability Awareness. Um, so the Alliance for Disability Awareness is a student-led organization on campus. Um, and we are established for the purpose of providing educational and social opportunities relating to the interests of students with disabilities and promoting an increased awareness within the communities of the abilities that we each have. Um, so today, since um, it is October, and October is Disability Awareness Month, we want to hear the stories of people who have disabilities or are affected by disabilities. Um, so today we have with us the lovely Dale, and I would just like to welcome Dale. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and just tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay, my name is Dale Held. Um, I am a transfer student. So technically I would be a junior, but um, I might be graduating later. So this is my third year is what I like to say. Um, I'm a psychology major on a pre-med track at University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, I don't know, uh, I guess my pronouns are she, her. Maybe that's a good thing to start. Um, anything else that I should let our listeners know? I guess, like, how did you come across finding out about this podcast? So I signed up for, uh, oh my, the ADA um, on Victor's Link, and because um, I wanted to be in a community uh, with, for people with disabilities, um, and one of the things that I got in an email was the ADA podcast, and I thought that it would be really nice to tell my story because uh, mine is really interesting because uh, I have an invisible disability as well as a it's not it's complicated because it's not rare anymore but it's a relatively unknown disability that um, most people don't know about so I thought I would spread some awareness about that. Well that's awesome we're so glad that you are on today and just excited to dive right into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so October is Disability Awareness Month. And so what does disability awareness mean to you? Um, so this is a really complicated question and I don't have a great answer for it. Um, but to me, disability awareness is, is really just being more aware that people with disabilities exist and that disability isn't just like a one size fits all. It's not just, um, you know, a person in a wheelchair or something like that, like it can, ha it can affect a range of people in very different ways. Um, and so being aware about how disability affects people um, and uh, the diversity of disability, I guess. Yeah, that's definitely so important. I think, yeah, disability, like, it covers such a, like a broad range of different disabilities, you know, disability awareness shouldn't just be about physical disabilities, but also mental disabilities, you know, disabilities mm -hmm. that people can see, people can't see, you yeah. know, a whole range of it. Um, Cause a lot of people are affected by disabilities. Mm -hmm. So just tell me a little bit about your story with um, just grappling with your disability. Okay, so, um... I'm gonna to try to keep this brief because it's kind of complicated. So I have a chronic illness that's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or EDS. Um, and it is a connective tissue disorder which affects collagen and collagen is in basically everything in your body from your organs to your veins, to your skin, your joints, um, everything. And so it causes uh, a lot of problems um, from like digestive issues to um, uh, circulatory issues, um, but mostly it affects your joints. And it means that basically every joint in my body is uh, hypermobile or double jointed. <laughs> so um, they're prone to dislocating or subluxing, which is a partial dislocation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an invisible disability. So if you were to see me, uh, you probably wouldn't know. Um, I can do like I the great conversation starter because I can do all of those like party tricks with my hands, but um, mostly I just tell people that I'm like hypermobile or hyperflexible, which is not true. It's not flexibility, but um, that's basically just what I tell like people um, all the time. 
um, and no one would know. And so when I have um, <clears throat> a flare of symptoms, uh, you wouldn't, no one would know. And it, it just makes it really hard for like navigating um, uh, like uh, accommodations because you, you don't really know what to give accommodations for when you can't see it. So yeah, that's, that's the main gist of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm, does it, is it like painful when you have those flare ups yeah. and it's just difficult <laughs> telling people about that pain? Cause they, when they see you, they just see like, yeah. Then when they see me, it's, it's just, Oh, she's fine. Um, I've had like professors because I have accommodations. I work with uh, the office of disability services at UM Dearborn and I've had professors both at my community college and here that are like, you never use your accommodations. Like, do you even need them? And it's like, they're there for a reason. Like, please don't say that to me. Please don't say that to anybody with accommodations. Like, that's not your call. Um, but like a typical flare for me um, is like just chronic pain everywhere. Um, I have scoliosis as part of my condition. And so my back will hurt like crazy. Um, uh, another thing that happens is that I won't be able to eat for a really long time, like weeks, because my stomach just won't tolerate it. Um, and uh, sometimes, which this doesn't happen anymore as often because I'm on medication, but it used to be that with flares, I would just feel really, really faint all day. And I couldn't do anything because I couldn't sit, like I couldn't sit up or I couldn't stand up because I would feel so lightheaded. Um, which is a circulatory issue uh, that causes, that's caused by EDS. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's what a typical flare looks like. And of course, like through all of this, no one would really know. Um, like I've had flares before where I just didn't tell anybody and no one, no one knew. Um, sometimes it's a little worse and I'll like, you know, have the heating pad or like have to go lay down for a long period of time. And in that case it is visible, but most of the time it isn't. So with your flare ups and everything, like how has COVID like staying at home with school, like how's online school for you? So getting to appointments has actually been kind of great. Because um, I, this is not necessarily related to my condition, but I can't drive even though I'm 20 years old. Um, and so getting to appointments is just, is hard, um, both for transportation issues and for health issues. So the fact that now I have the option of talk, talking to my therapist or my uh, PCP, my primary care physician um, online is really great. Um, and I wish I had that ability all the time, but uh, eventually it's gonna go away and that really, that really sucks. Um, so the other thing is that the sort of double-edged sword of it all is like that I don't like, uh, I can't visit my specialists because my specialists don't offer online communication um, and I can't, like the online school has just been really, really tricky because it's, you can't just like miss a day of online school and just be like, oh, I was out because I was having a flare. Like I can't email my professors and be like, hey, I'm having a flare right now. I can't do any of my work right now. Cause they're just like, you've been assigned it this whole time. Like, what do you mean? You, you have to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it makes it a lot more complicated. And especially because school right now is completely just not normal um, in terms of like online classes. Like the online classes I'm taking right now are not the on online classes I was taking before COVID. And so the workload is just completely different. So yeah, navigating this with COVID is, is weird. Um, and there is some like great things, but it's mostly just bad. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely realized that compared to, like, the winter semester, like, I feel like these online classes have so much more work compacted yeah. in a week, and, like, before it was just, like, attend lecture, and then you'll have, like, a final, mm -hmm. like, halfway through, and now it's, like, you have to do 
all the readings and all these discussion mm -hmm. posts and quizzes and yeah, everything like, like that. Seventy it's hours. so much work. Um, I could be like sitting down and like all day be working on stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When so I took a mixture of online and in person classes, mostly in person. Um, when I was taking in person classes before COVID, like I had free time all the time. Like I had actual weekends. Like I could just uh, dedicate an hour to watching Netflix. And I think a lot of students share the same sentiment that you just can't do that. You don't have weekends. Um, it's just whenever there's a break that you take a break. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like you're working towards like trying to take a break, but then that never comes. So like, it just, it starts wearing down on your mental health really badly. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, for me, like, I like think of the week as like, one week at a time like I just have to get through this week yeah and then I, I can't even look ahead like two weeks because there's just so yeah, much you, work you just get overwhelmed like I'm looking to get through the end of the week but then a small part of me knows that at the end of the week it's gonna be the same yeah yeah um so what school did you transfer from I transferred from Lake Michigan Community College um, it's in Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is all the way on the west side of the state. Um, I lived in the dorms. They have very nice dorms. Um, this is like a slight plug for Lake Michigan College. Uh, they have really good like health profession stuff. So uh, check them out. But yeah, so that's where I transferred from. Um, I was majoring in psychology there too. Um, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. That's, that's my plug. <laughs> did you transfer um from that college before covid or like this semester is like um, your first semester so this is my first semester but i and i don't know if i would have done this differently i applied to U umd dearborn before covid and then covid hit and but i had already been accepted at U umd dearborn so i wasn't gonna just back out um and I couldn't, I wasn't sure of my living situation in Benton Harbor because um, previously in the winter, or they call it the spring semester over there, um, but basically the semester from January until May, um, sometime in March, we got kicked out of our dorms and we mm -hmm. had to vacate the premises. And if that would have happened again, then like, I don't know if like what would have happened. Um, and so I, I couldn't really go back for this semester. Um, so yeah, so now I'm at U of M Dearborn. Um, I live in the union, which is like the student apartments. Um, and I have heard from other people that like, well, why, like, why would you move? Like, just stay home and save the money. And mostly to that, I just say like, I need to be on my own. There's no way that I would be getting any work done at home. Um, so so yeah, it's, it's been strange and I don't know if I would have just stayed at Lake Michigan College because right after I like definitely knew that I was coming to UM Dearborn, they said Lake Michigan College said that they were reducing tuition and UM Dearborn said that they were increasing tuition mm. and I was like, did I make a mistake? <laughs> yeah, so, that's probably a little bit bad timing. <laughs> yeah, it was, I, and I'm taking, I'm a pre-med student so I'm taking like uh, my um, my science courses online I'm taking chemistry right now which I'm kind of retaking it because it didn't transfer but like uh, now like they only just refunded my lab fees and they weren't going to do that before and I was like should I have just stayed at Lake Michigan College and taken really reduced tuition for taking chemistry like Mm, the world they never know it's it's in the past I can't I can't change it now yeah like there was no way of knowing that a whole pandemic was going to flip no, everything upside no. down no way no like back in December I'm like oh wow look China's having this virus and I was like really like intrigued with, like watching it and seeing mm -hmm. what happened but I never thought that oh, it would wow. like come to the U.S. I thought like the U.S. would be like Lockdown, like completely, like 
I had so much trust in the CDC, and then now I'm like, I don't even know what's going on. Yeah, I, I've completely just, like, on both sides of the political spectrum, I've just not really been trusting anything that comes out about COVID, because the next week it will change. Um, and, like, in March, when schools first shut down, it was like, oh, we have another week of spring break. Um, and my friend, who um, I've been friends with for years, who I was also a roommate with, at Lake Machine College, we were um, planning on going, she wanted to go to like Canada and vacation down to Florida to go to Disney World. And then that was on Thursday. And then by that Monday, we were in full blown quarantine. <laughs> so yeah, that, it, was, it was great. You get whiplash, but uh, it's fun. Yeah, it happened really fast. Yeah. I know, like, I have a few labs back on campus now, and it's very strict with, like, what we have to do, like, having, like, a mask at all times, even when outside, like, there's barely anyone on campus. It just feels really weird because, like, I miss that, like, in-person community on campus, and now it's just, like, like, it's so exhausting being online, like, every day, all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I signed up for classes, um, like, purposefully trying to find classes that didn't meet on campus, um, because, like, I can't, I'm not technically immunocompromised. Um, The Ehlers-Danlos Association actually came out with a statement when COVID hit saying that technically people with EDS wouldn't be more susceptible to COVID, but I didn't really want to take chances of catching COVID or getting sick with my condition because it would just be catastrophic even if like I'm not more susceptible. Um, Just having a chronic illness and then having acute illness on top of that is just not something that I want to do. Um, so I previously had a French class that met at Fairlane campus that I ended up dropping and then switching into a psychology class. Um, so yeah, I have no in-person classes and, uh, I don't, I don't know if I like it or not because again, like online classes aren't real online classes right now. And so I don't know if I would rather just have taken in-person classes and did like just face that risk, just took the risk. Um, or if I would have just stayed online knowing that it would be like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, what uh, psychology classes are you taking? I am taking uh, a physiological psych class. So that is psychology 370. Um, and then I'm also taking cognitive neuroscience, which is psychology 400. Um, But basically, they're both neuroscience classes, which I didn't know when I signed up for them. But it's it's fine. It's kind of fun. Uh, They kind of play off of each other. So I don't have to watch like as many lectures because one will be taught in one of them. And then I'll just use it for the other class. So yeah, yeah, it works works out. It's pretty great. So yeah. So what got you into wanting to go on a pre-med track, wanting to have psychology as your major? You know, what got you into wanting to go into the health field? Okay, so it actually has nothing to do with my physical disabilities um, because I diagnosed physical disabilities um, uh, like the last year of high school, like senior year, so um, maybe three years ago. Um, was when I really got sick. But, um, I have a his- like my a family history of um, mental health issues. Um, before senior year, when I really got sick with um, my physical disabilities, I was struggling with a lot of mental health issues. And I have a family history of mental health issues. And so I sort of knew firsthand what the psychiatric care, mental health care was like. And it it's not great it's, um, in terms of like um, emergency psychiatrics. Um, and so I was uh, like freshman year is when most of this happened. And um, after I kind of got better and was able to like function again, um, before all of the physical illness took, took hold, 
Um, I really wanted to become a psychologist and change how we treat mental health, um, especially around here, because um, if you know of anybody who struggled with uh, mental health as a teenager and had to go into emergency psychiatric care, um, there, like, there is well-known facilities in Michigan that people are like, don't ever go to it because it's horrible. Um, and I don't think that we should, that should ever be a thing. Like, it should never be known to teenagers that there's a psychiatric care facility that no one wants to go to. Um, and uh, I live in Ann Arbor right next to U of M. And U of M has a really great inpatient unit for adolescents, but no one can get in because they only have a limited number of beds. And so um, when I was in high school, I, I just didn't, I never wanted that to happen to anyone ever again. Um, so I wanted to be a psychologist and then the pre-med track kind of came later because, because I want to work in emergency psychiatrics, usually they hire psychiatrists. So that means pre-med. And so the jury's still out on that one. Uh, I don't know if I'll just like burn out and won't be able to go to med school. And when I'm having a really bad flare, I'm like constantly like, <laughs> Do I, do I have what it takes to go to med school? Um, but that's, that's the reasoning behind the path that I'm trying to take. Um. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that and for getting a little bit personal with it too. And yeah. I think definitely the conversation on mental health should be more wide span and it, you know, people should talk about it openly too, because there's mm -hmm. issues that you know, are not being addressed because of the stigma with mental health and like making mm -hmm. assumptions about what emergency uh, psychiatry, did I pronounce that yeah. right? Yeah, emergency psychiatry, emergency psychiatry. psychiatry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's just, I don't want to like turn into like really political besides go vote, but um, there's no funding in mental health care um, and especially in adolescent emergency psychiatrics. Um, when I was, uh, like, go when, like, my family and I was going through all of that, like, I was researching what rights you have as a teenager going into emergency psychiatrics, and you have none, just zero. Um, I think Wisconsin gives you more rights as an adolescent going into inpatient care than in Michigan, which is just, it's like, that's just not <laughs> how it should be. Yeah. Especially like adolescents, like they're only, young, like they're so young. Yeah, they're like, children. <laughs> yeah, they're children. Like to have all this, like to have like them be afraid of going in and getting like the care that they need. Yeah, like having health care. If they're afraid of it, they're not gonna go into it, or they'll go into it with like so much fear yeah. built up you know yeah because it's already in it's already so scary to go inpatient um to go like even intensive outpatient which basically means you're in a day program um it's so scary to ask for help and get help to that ex extreme and then to be told by like your peers that oh don't go to this facility because it was horrible is like that that's not okay. Like kids should never have to be scared because the facility is bad. Yeah. So how do you think that these facilities are like working now? How do you think that these facilities are working now given the fact of like all the COVID restrictions and like, like have a lot of these facilities shut down or are they doing like less inpatient things? Do you so have I any, actually... Like I actually know exactly what they're doing right now because I have a family member that's going through the mental health, the emergency mental health system right now. And she's, um, I think 12 or 13. Um, and so, um, it's a very, very long story, but, um, uh, most of the intensive outpatient, uh, programs, which is you, instead of going to school, you would go every day to like a, a, a group like do group therapy and art therapy and stuff like that and you would go to that instead of school so most of them um don't aren't working right now um they're closed and then there's a couple um 
that are a little smaller that are working and she ended up going to one of those. Um, in terms of inpatient psychiatrics, they are very full right now. Um, and I've been talking with my therapist about this a little bit, um, who sort of explained that um, with, with trauma, which is what COVID is, it's a huge trauma that everyone is experiencing at once. There's only so long that you can be in a trauma response until you start to break down. And we are at that point now where kids are starting to break down because we are now going back into school. And um, at least at U of M and at a few other facilities, they are just overflowing with cases of people who are, who are trying to get inpatient. And um, my family member who ended up going to an intensive outpatient instead of inpatient went three times and was supposed to be admitted three times and never was. So yeah, they're just, they're overwhelmed. I think now more than ever is the time to step up with mental yeah. health care. Yeah, um, I guess. Especially with all this going on. I guess for um, with, like for people who have already experienced trauma and have the coping skills to deal with trauma, they're doing much better off, which you would think that it would be different, that people who had experienced trauma, who, uh, that they would be triggered by COVID, but it's actually the opposite because they have the coping skills to deal with trauma. It's the people who are experiencing trauma for the first time that really can't ha handle it because they don't have any coping skills in place. They've never been to therapy. Um, they, so they can't, like, they can't cope with COVID. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. Like I work in the hospital as like a tech. I'm also pre-med, so um, nice. it's cool interviewing you. <laughs> um, but I've definitely seen like a rise and like there's a lot of like, people coming in at risk for suicide and people coming in for alcoholism like there's a whole it's not just the pandemic of covid but it's a mental health pandemic going on yes. too yeah with it, people it, being isolated and like away from people and just having like fear and just like depressing mm -hmm. news every day like it wears out on you. Yeah, people say all the time that the number one indicator or the number one cause or indicator suicide is isolation and we are literally in that right now we are literally being forced to isolate so what do you think are ways that we can like combat this issue um i know it's like very overwhelming and it's a, like super big issue but like what can we do to like help out where like you know one person can help out um like reaching out to people around them, you know, what can we do? Yeah, I think, I think being connected with people is good, even if you're not seeing them in person. Um, like I call my mom way more than I would have like last year when I was living alone. Um, and I, I'm an introvert. Like I don't like to be around other people for very long. And like, I still am affected. And so I can't imagine what extroverts are feeling right now um, but I have heard uh like suggestions of doing like a social distance friendly study group like just going outside and getting a few friends together and wearing masks and studying outside um facetiming people and calling people and I know that a lot of people don't like social media but honestly contacting each other through social social media is great like any sort of connection that you can do um and like obviously like check in on your friends um be sort of aware if they post anything that's sort of a red flag or um they say anything that's a red flag um because i mean you you know them and if you think that something's a little off maybe send them a quick text and be like hey like how's it going and you don't even have to go in and be like, hey, I saw that post, but just like checking in and just knowing that you're there. Yeah, I think that's so important. Thank you for bringing up those facts. And like for people that are listening in on this, they can also mm -hmm. hear about that and um, use yeah. that, especially right now, especially if we head into the winter months too, like it's very yeah. harder and harder 
to meet up in person without shivering your butt off <laughs> so yeah and um, seasonal affective disorder is real I get it yeah. um and even people who are like you know pretty mentally healthy I think still feel a little more gloomy um apparently do I've heard doctors say that people in Michigan don't get adequate vitamin D um so take vitamin D do some light therapy open your windows when it's sunny out um and then continue trying to connect with other people yeah yeah no I think um I'm taking a nutritional anthropology right now and um vitamin d is something that like everyone in like the upper latitude is like short of which is crazy yes vitamin d and is thinking, amazing. thinking about like how i think there's some um studies that have shown that like it helps with covid symptoms as well i don't know did you hear about that i don't i haven't heard of it specifically but i do know that vitamin d um helps with immune responses um just, I, I can't plug it enough. Please uh, take vitamin D if you're not going outside regularly. Um, like, you need it. It's, it's a, like one of the major vitamins that you need. Mm -hmm. So get outside. Uh, this yeah. weekend will be nice, so. <laughs> yeah, like not to plug like uh, supplements and anything, but if you're going to take a supplement, vitamin D is the one. Yeah, no, definitely. So I guess as we wrap up this conversation, like, what do you have to say to people that are watching this that maybe don't really know a lot about disabilities, but just want to hear more about um, disabilities and, you know, how they affect people? Um, well, check out Ehlers Danlos Association. Um, learn more about it. It's I'm not going to say it's a great disease because that's not how, that's not what I mean, but it's very interesting, especially for people who are like pre-med. It's very interesting. Um, and like just education in general, like uh, learn more about disabilities, know that it can affect people different ways, know that um, like uh, mental illness can itself be a disability. Um, so we haven't really been going off topic here. Like it, it really is relevant guys. Uh, and um yeah go vote um yeah i i think that's mostly it all right thank you so much dale for coming on today and speaking i think you had like so many good things to say and i think um you'll be awesome working with psychiatry and oh, definitely go you. for it don't let anything stop you um mrs p she's the pre-health advisor yes She's awesome, you know, I, I have a meeting with her next week, and yeah, she's awesome, so um, I wish you the best of luck with everything. Oh, thank you. All right, I'm going to finish up this podcast. I want to stop recording. Okay. Wait, I should probably have a conclusion. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, everyone, for watching this or for listening to this, and uh, this wraps up our first um, mini episode in our podcast series, ADA Airwaves. Bye, everyone.